So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Professor Desai, um, and I'll just say a Padma. little bit. Sorry? Padma. Padmaji. Okay. Um, she is the Gladys and Roland uh, Harriman Professor of Comparative Economic Systems and the Director of the Center for Transition Econo Economies at Columbia University. She's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, she was the President of the Association for Comparative Economic Studies in 2001. Um, she received her PhD in economics from Harvard in 1960, um, where she started her teaching career before she went to Columbia. Um, and she writes um, about uh, economic planning in the Soviet Union um, and now has switched her research agenda to economic reforms in Russia and emerging market economies. Um, her, among her publications are Marxism, Central Planning in the Soviet Economy, The Soviet Economy Problems and Prospects, Perestroika in Perspective, The Design and Dilemmas of Soviet Reform, uh, Glowing Go Global, Transition from Plan to Market in the World Economy, Work Without Wages, Russia's Non-Payment Crisis, and um, finally, her, her book um, entitled Financial Crisis, Contagion, and Containment from Asia to Argentina was described by Paul Krugman as the best book yet on financial crisis. You can see she's sort of um, uh, a public intellectual. She's um, been uh, written in the New York Times, the Financial Times, um, the Wall Street Journal. Um, she's appeared on the McNeil, McNeil Lehrer um, on CNN, BBC, Jim Lehrer, and the Charlie Rose Show. Um, so um, today we're going to be talking about her book, which is a, um, a really interesting um, autobiography about her her life um, uh, and her journey to, to, to today. Um, and um, I'll say a few words about the, the book. Actually, I'm going to sit down since I'm a small group. Um, and then I'll turn over, and I think, Padmanji, you're going to re read a little bit from the book? and then uh, Or talk about the book? Say a little bit and then read a little bit. OK, and then we'll open it up. Um, so this book, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that people haven't read it because it's not been available, but um, I had the pleasure of, it, of an advanced copy. Um, it's really, uh, to me, there's kind of two themes in this, in, this, in this incredible journey that she's taken. And one is this story of migration, and that's one that, that I think about a lot as a scholar of migration, as a, children, a child of immigrants. I was born in the U.S. My parents are from India, and I heard a lot of resonance with my, 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 my own mother's um, journey um, in this book. Um, and it's a kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a migration, it's a historical migration story because um, a migration, of course, has changed and the United States has changed and India has changed and, you know, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and it's, it's, it's also a story to me about um, gender in modern India. Um, and, you know, she talks a lot, and you sort of hear these, these resonances in the book about the way that um, she um, struggled with her, her own identity as a woman, as a professional, as a wife, um, as a daughter, um, and, and, you know, put all of these together, both in the Indian context and then in the context of the United States. Um, and, you know, I can say a little bit more about that um, after she's had a chance to speak. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to the conversation, um, and I'll, I'll turn it over. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here um, at Harvard. Um, so many of my friends from my old days are here, and uh, um, I feel happy and at the top of the world uh, just being with my friends uh, and all of you. Um, thankful to Lakshmi and David uh, for arranging this, and Nora um, for doing all the detailed work. Um, thank you for your um, words um, uh, on diaspora. Um, Harvard, I mean, uh, ever since I was little, uh, growing up in a provincial town uh, in Gujarat and north of Bombay, Surat, which was in those days, 70, 80 years ago, a town of shopkeepers, essentially. Uh, I wanted to uh, be a writer, <laughs> excel academically, uh, reach out for the stars, uh, and go to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, so um, uh, in, in 1947, I um, passed the matriculation examination. 48,000 students missed my first rank by two marks. Uh, still remember that. Um, and then went to Bombay, having topped the list of uh, BA examination students in economics from Bombay University. Got lots of scholarships and went to Bombay, uh, where my life 
uh, uh, took a ruinous turn, but about that a little later. Uh, but uh, I came to Harvard in 1955, um, and uh, I came by boat uh, from the, across the Arabian Sea and then the Atlantic, um, two boats. Um, a lot of excitement. It took me altogether maybe 16 days to do the journey. Um, and um, uh, landed at Founder's House uh, on Appian Way. Uh, and I wrote to my father that I'm living in this dormitory, one story building, uh, a dilapidated wooden house on Appian Way. <laughs> and my father wrote to me, Appian Way is also a Roman highway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and it was, it was, it really turned out to be such an enchanting world. I mean, uh, I grew up with a lot of admiration of flowers, trees, bushes, fruits. My father was an avid gardener, uh, lover of music, a professor of English literature with a BA degree from Cambridge University. So it was all high class, but at a certain level. And so um, I discovered new plants, new flowers, aspen, alder, lilac. Uh, and I was just mesmerized. The elm trees uh, in Harvard Yard. And I sort of used to touch the one tree which I could not resist touching often was the birch tree, because I had never seen a tree with a white trunk. Uh, and it was so soft. And so uh, that was my introduction to the uh, natural world. Um, and late August, uh, I mean, the leaves hurling their August uh, fire into the sky. And I picked up a couple of leaves, all red and golden, and sent them to my father, um, as if he didn't know. Anyway. Um, the dormitory founder's house, there was only one fixed telephone rotary. I'm talking about 1955, 56, 57. Um, and I called my father, my mother, once a year. That was it. Uh, on August 15, uh, which was India's Independence Day. And I wanted to hear my father's voice. So I called him once a year. So I called him four times a year during my four years when I was a student at, um, uh, at um, uh, Harvard. Um, I mean, beyond the flowers and the trees and the natural world, uh, the Cambridge Commons, and I was wearing a sari. The sartorial change came much later. Um, and the children used to chase me in Cambridge Commons. Gypsy woman, gypsy woman. <laughs> and so uh, they're bicycles. And so I said, can I ride your bicycle? Oh, they were aghast. The gypsy woman can ride a bicycle. <laughs> and so we rode the bicycle. And I have a picture with them in, in the book. Um, and so I, my introduction to Harvard was um, in every way, uh, it, it was exhilarating. It was energizing. And it was totally liberating, uh, four years from 1955 to 1959. Uh, and then there was, of course, the Litauer uh, Center, um, where the economics department was. Um, Dale Jorgensen here and I, we went to all the classes together. Uh, and I met Dale before. I had met Jagdish, um, <laughs> and we have been close friends um, ever say. since. Uh, <laughs> Dale, of course, is now the university professor. Um, and uh, the um, it, it was I was sort of the exotic creature from the far side of the planet, and I sat would sit down in Litha libraries reading, following the syllabus, I must get A grades. And I got three A grades in my very first term. And the dean of Radcliffe College, Bernice Brown Cronkite, invited me for a dinner at her house for a visiting Indian. 
And um, so I remember these three Americans on a GI Bill. They were all blonde haired, blue eyes. And of course, I had not seen blonde haired, blue eyed men, right? So I was fascinated by them. The three of them would sit around me, and they were fascinated with me. So the conversation would ch start chit-chatting about this and that. And then one of them, whose name I will not reveal, because now he's a three-star general in the US military, um, he would tell me, what are you doing here? Uh, you should be in <coughs> Hollywood. So well, that was not. Uh, politically a very correct um, comment. Uh, uh, but for those days, uh, uh, it was, I mean, it didn't, uh, uh, didn't matter. Um, the very end of second year, it was Lee Preston, I think, who said, would you like to be a teaching fellow? I said, of course, would I like to be a teaching fellow? Yes. Um, I was still wearing a sari. And, uh, so the photographers descended, uh, Bombay woman teaching Harvard men. <laughs> and my picture appeared in the Times of India and the Boston Herald and the Singapore Times. And, and my father sent me a cutting from the Times of India. And uh, that picture is at the back of the book. Um, and um, so I, uh, as a teaching, I would ask questions like, where do I put an accent on this word? I had learned English literature from my father, right? Accent is important um, in English. So a voice from the back would say, Professor, suit yourself. Who cares how you speak English in America? <laughs> and I have never looked <laughs> back. <laughs> so. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, experiences, which are detailed uh, in my book, uh, uh, happy, all of them. But then there were certain negative aspects. In those days, um, uh, we women, I think there were three of us as graduate students, uh, we, we took the same exam, graduate exam, but we were put separately. Uh, uh, in a Radcliffe, Radcliffe uh, Hall, different uh, from the men. Uh, and of course, Radcliffe College, I mean, uh, I forgot to tell you that uh, in the 1950s, the education minister of Bombay, um, Mrs. Nimbalkar, she invited me and she said, you know, I'm going to send you to America to four-year fellowship um, to a leading women's college in the Northeast. Uh, and I said, no, um, I want to go to a proper university in America and compete with men. So send me to Ratcliffe College. <laughs> and so when I got the, um, she couldn't of course, but when I got the American Association of University Women Fellowship, um, I of course applied to MIT. Uh, and. Uh, should I tell the name? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bob Bishop, he wrote to me, uh, said, apply to Radcliffe College. What did that mean? MIT didn't admit women? What difference did it make? I ultimately ended up at Harvard, right? So um, that was, uh, that was brought, what brought me here. Um, so um, the I mean, some of the negative elements I mentioned about how we took our exams separately from the men. Uh, but you know, in those days, the PhD qualifying uh, process was very tough. I think it was tougher than now. Uh, I don't know what some of you would think. Because before we qualified for the PhD, beginning to write the thesis, we were required to take an two-hour oral exam before we began writing the thesis. Four professors would examine me in monetary economic statistics, economic theory, international trade, and their names would be revealed to me the previous evening. So who would I prepare for the test? Leontief would examine me or Chamberlain? Uh, who would examine me in? Uh, 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 
in um, economic theory, would it be Chamberlain or uh, well, Leontifer Chamberlain or statistics? Was it uh, John Meyer or uh, uh, Guy Orcutt? And I was just preparing and preparing and preparing. But anyway, the test went off well, and so then I qualified to write my PhD. And then that viva, I think, is abolished in American universities today. Not here. I don't know. OK. Uh, in, in Columbia, it is abolished. There is a written test at Columbia uh, where students take the written test to qualify for writing the PhD. Then when you finish your PhD, you are examined again. And that was, uh, uh, I applied Leontief's. Uh, Leontief was my professor. Um, input-output system to Indian data. I think that was the very first application to Indian data. It was published in 1961, my first article in the Review of Economics and Statistics. Um, and uh, so I did well. And I still remember Gottfried Habeler, who was one of my professor, one of the uh, committee members. And he said, when are you leaving for India? And I said, day after tomorrow. I had been in America at Harvard for four years. <laughs> I hadn't seen my family for four years. I didn't have the money to. And there were no very few airplanes which flew uh, between uh, Harvard, between Cambridge and Bombay. Anyway, so he said, when are you leaving for India? And I said, day after tomorrow. So Gottfried Habeler, he looked at me. And he said, what if we decide to fail you? I said, no, you won't. <laughs> and so uh, I uh, went, to, uh, went back to India 59. Remember my father walking all the way from the house entry to the garden gate and embracing me. Uh, so um, Harvard, of course, is, uh, is very precious for me. Uh, my adrenaline, did I spell, uh, pronounce it right? My adrenaline flows high when I walk uh, in Harvard Yard. Um, there is a favorite elm tree. I remember when I was sitting under the tree, uh, sari clad, and uh, reading a book. And uh, my friends, Barbara Berman, Bluma Goldstein, Bayara uh, Arutevich, uh, Bluma sees me from a distance. Um, and she says, hey, savage. <laughs> she says, hey, savage, uh, you speak English. <laughs> so there were so many uh, passersby. Uh, this is Harvard Yard, right? And, and they all started looking. Uh, and so I looked back. And I said, Bluma, cut that crap. <laughs> 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 I may have been reading Raymond Chandler, I think. So, so uh, these are some of the stories. Um, no, Harvard is precious, uh, everything about Harvard. Uh, and um, my favorite river in America, I mean, it's not the Hudson. Um, it's not the Mississippi. Uh, it's the Charles. Uh, that is... Uh, that is how attached I feel uh, about this place. Um, finally, why Russia? Uh, because people ask me, uh, well, because when I was a teenager, <coughs> I read Dostoevsky, Pristuplenie um, in Akazanie in uh, English translation, Constance Garnett. <sighs> I have got to read this in the original Russian. I made a pledge to myself. I was probably 14, 15, my father's library, which books he had brought from England. And uh, so when I ended up at Harvard, I also registered in the Slavic department. And I started r learning Russian. I and mean, all that is also in the book, the jokes, the stories, the entertaining um, instruction which we got from Bayara. And uh, uh, the... Um, other reason why I moved into the Russian, Soviet Russian field was I wrote a joint book with Jagdish, um, uh, Planning for Industrialization, uh, 1968, was it published? Um, and it was a big hit. Uh, we were arguing for market-based reforms. But I said, 
no more books jointly with Jagdish, uh, because I don't want to be a subservient author to him. Uh, I'm serious about it. So uh, I chose to go into my own field, the Soviet Russian field. I, my planning model was published. I knew Russian. Um, and uh, Russians, when they look at me, always ask me, um, why Russia? And I always say, because of Dostoevsky. But they say, oh, he's so disturbing. But I say, that is exactly why. <laughs> what is the point of stepping into a field which is lacking in challenges? Uh, so, but there, the, uh, I recall a conversation I had when I entered um, an elevator. I go to. Russia often, the last visit was in September uh, on behalf of the State Department, but uh, that I think is going to stop because Vladimir Putin is coming down like this uh, on us Americans. So I enter um, an elevator, elevator, I was wearing salwar kameez, kameez and salwar, the Muslim outfit, and I get into the elevator. And the men started debate, debating my identity. Atkuda Anna, where is she from? And of course, I Russian, I understand Russian, so they were, I was looking at them. Uh, what black eyes? What long hair? They were describing me, and I was smiling. Uh, and then, then one of them said, Anna Tsiganka, she's a gypsy woman. So, uh, I said the Svidanya to them and <laughs> went my way. So uh, making, a, making a, uh, a, a, an I professional identity in Russia, if I had blue eyes and blonde hair, it would have been easier uh, as an American scholar of Russia, in Russia and in America as well. Uh, but I'm doing very well. Um, uh, as an established uh, sort of pioneer of applying market economy techniques to a variety of Soviet Russian problems. Uh, uh, finally, a word about my personal uh, life. Uh, 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 full of anguish and uh, loneliness uh, for a number of years. Uh, the stay in Bombay as a graduate student in 51 to 53, messed up my life. Um, uh, got married. To, I was a total nincompoop, <laughs> reading books all the time. Uh, the only men I had known in my life at that point was my father and my brother. Uh, and uh, so uh, I got married to a man ultimately who infected me to, with a venereal disease, uh, who would not divorce me uh, later on. And uh, then uh, uh, around 1965, 66, uh, his lawyer contacts my lawyer. My parents were in favor of uh, divorcing uh, and breaking up the marriage, and says to our lawyer that if she changes her religion, then we will agree, meaning my ex-husband's side will agree, because in the Hindu Code Bill of 1955, a sacramental marriage can be dissolved if one party sues, uh, if one party undertakes a change of religion, uh, and the and, and, and the other party sues. You can't just dissolve your marriage sacramental by changing your religion. But then most men would, probably quite a few men would do it in India, right? <laughs> so the other party has to sue for judicial separation that leads to, finally leads to, uh, uh, to divorce. So my parents agreed. I mean, my father, uh, they were not, uh, 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 non-religious people, both of them, but this, if this could, uh, this could release me, uh, why not? So they agreed, and here I would just spend a few minutes um, reading uh, a couple of pa passages from the book um, about my conversion uh, to Christianity. 
and uh, my brother Dinkar uh, and uh, the Christian friend who had arranged for the uh, conversion, he accompanies us. Uh, we go by train from my hometown to this village, which is probably three hours train ride, two and a half, three to the east from my hometown. Uh, so here it goes. Um, I cannot recall the exact year or date of my conversion, nor the name of the village or of the pastor. I, sat out, I set out in the train with Dinkar and Mr. Ehrlich on a day that turned out to be damp, rainy, and windy. When I got off the train, I could barely hold on to my umbrella as I made my way through the brush and the brambles and the mud on the uneven terrain, my sandals slipping away from my feet that were beginning to get sore. The village had no roads, and I followed the two men who led the way to the pastor's hut, often pulling out the brush that was caught in my sari. We soon learned that the pastor was also the village chief. He welcomed us to a small, dark place, his living space, which smelled like a damp barn and threatened to collapse under the weight of the rain. We sat on the cow dung finished floor and awaited lunch as our host talked about life in the village, the encroaching wildlife and the dangers it posed to the villagers. As we talked, he got up, pulled out a rickety makeshift ladder, adjusted it against the edge of a thatched attic underneath the leaky roof, crawled inside and pulled out a tiger's head. It was small and decaying with sunken eyes, a couple of dried whiskers protruding on each side of its shriveled mouth. For lunch, we were served a small pile of coarse rice topped with a couple of spoonfuls of dal and chopped raw onions. There was no bread which I had read Jesus described as my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world, nor wine symbolic of the promise that says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. My thoughts were elsewhere. If this was a feast for the honored guests whom the village chief had invited for a special purpose, what did the poor in the village eat? I wondered as we hurried with the food and prepared to set out for the church. The church resembled the pastor's hut, except that it was bigger with a couple of makeshift pillars in the center supporting the thatched roof. In its musty silence, I could see a group of women sitting in a corner, their heads covered and their feet hidden under the folds of their saris. A few men sat on the other side, staring in front of them, some blowing their noses on the ends of their shirts. My conversion was voluntary, and these were my witnesses. I stood next to Dinkar and tightly grasped his hand as we faced the pastor who held a small bowl in his hand. I knew my full immersion in water, guaranteeing me God's total grace and promise of a new life was ruled out. The pastor had agreed to that. I started crying in anticipation of a ritual unfolding amidst the austere surroundings of a dirt poor village as I watched the rain outside and the assembly in front of me that might well have stepped out of a Gauguin painting. This will be very brief, the pastor said. He sprinkled a few drops of water over my head and pronounced me a Christian in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How was I to picture this God invoked by the Trinity of the Father, the Son Jesus himself, and the Spirit that would be sent by the Father following the death of Jesus? Did I feel different? Had I stepped into an unfamiliar religious domain 
Would I need to grasp its teachings in the days ahead? I thought of father, a farm boy, who having discovered his God in the village, had gone on to nurture him in the way he lived his life and taught me to live mine. Did it matter which God I would surrender myself to in my hour of need? Suddenly I heard Dinker's voice. We must rush to the station or we will miss the train, I heard him say to the pastor, who assured him that the train would await our arrival. He had sent a boy to the station with the message. It was getting dark and Dinker and Mr. Ehrlich dragged me over the rain-swept undulating terrain in the direction of the station. Sure enough, the train awaited us. Dinkar thrust a few coins into the boy's hand and we dashed into the compartment. A few days later, <clears throat> father received the baptism certificate which he forwarded to the lawyer so that the judicial process could move forward. He was told that my ex-husband had changed his mind. He, the impeccable executioner towering over his soiled victim, was not interested in pursuing the idea further. Was my conversion pointless then? I had started out considering it as a convenient expedient to resolve a deadlocked situation and to win my life back so that I could be happy again. That was not to be. Were I, however, to undergo a spiritual crisis and feel rudderless and truly desire to surrender to a Christian God, I would locate that tiny village for a replay of my conversion that to this day remains the truly spiritual experience of my life. I have not wanted to become a Hindu again because I do not wish to spoil my memories of an event that in its simplicity and directness turned out to be altogether genuine. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you read that, that passage because for me that's one of the really powerful um, passages in the book. And, um, really brings up, you know, so many of these questions about identity, gender, um, being a wife, being a professional. Um, so I, I really um, enjoyed that, and I enjoyed um, the book. I'll just make a few comments about the book, and then I'll open it up for um, discussion. And I'll just keep my eye on the time so I don't talk too long. Um, so um, uh, I mentioned, I sort of alluded to this earlier, that um, I really enjoyed this story, and in part because so much of the book really resonated with um, my own kind of family's journey, and in particular my mom's. And so my mother and Padmaji and, you know, many professional women um, in this kind of newly independent India, um, I think really kind of grappled with um, this modernization project that happened in post-independence India. Um, and, um, you know, on the one hand, it inspired professional aspirations um, in women, uh, in particular um, classes, of course, um, while at the same time, um, I think these same women um, also struggled to maintain, uh, to think, to, to craft a new modern gender identity, um, because on the, um, being really deeply rooted in Indian traditions, um, and this is not just India, but I, you know, I think this was around, this was happening in the United States as well, as you alluded to in terms of what was going on at Harvard and your, your role as a woman, not just an Indian woman um, at Harvard. Um, you know, this notions of chastity, being a good woman or a good wife, um, and I think it put women in a complex place. And you, 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 you really hear that struggle in this book. Um, and it, it just resonated with my own um, understanding of you know, my mother in terms of you know, her, um, your um, the painful first marriage, um, you know, your parents' support of your career. Um, but at the same time, sometimes ambivalence popping up when, you know, OK, this is a little too modern. And OK, you know, uh, the, you know, how they sort of dealt with the, 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 the first marriage, the, the relationship, and then marriage. Um, you know, um, and there's, there's this funny juxtaposition, which is that, you know, you talk about this, um, when you had this opportunity to go to have this, this, this great position at Columbia and that, that, that and that, that, the feelings of guilt at, at, at bringing your husband, um, along and taking him away from Harvard, um, and, 
Sorry? MIT. MIT. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. MIT. Thank you. Um, and, you know, for, for my mother, it was the opposite, which she always mm -hmm. felt, you know, she was a doctor, but always felt that she was, had, she had resentment for, because she had to follow, you know, stop and start her career for follow, because she was following her husband. So it just highlights for me that there, there was no good option. And I think that this was the sort of the, the, the struggle. Um, and so, um, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, it's also a story about cultural change and migration, and I study migration and education, and, you know, through that, I'm used to thinking about stories, um, much more the stories of people like your daughter, um, Anuradha, um, which um, you, you, you know, talk about your relationship a lot in detail, um, you know, uh, the sort of U.S.-born children of immigrants is what, I, is what I study, and it's not a coincidence that I am the U.S.-born child of immigrants. Um, and so, you know, I appreciated that opportunity to sort of think about this from the lens of the parents as well. Um, and it's a historical book because, um, you know, today professional women from India coming to do a PhD at a place like Harvard or work um, and become faculty members um, will have a very different experience. They have quicker links to India, it's much more transnational ties, um, much more easily travel back and forth. Obviously, you know, the, they can talk to their father on Skype, um, on email, um, immediately. Um, and, you know, there's also this kind of diasporic, they see culture that they can sort of take part in in a way that, um, that didn't really exist when you were coming at that time. So I think it's a really important story to tell. Um, the last thing I'll say that I was thinking about as you were talking about, you know, how you ended up in Soviet studies is that I think there's this interesting, um, you know, there's this interesting history, um, kind of cultural history in India where there's this strong so cultural influence. So, you know, you were reading Dostoevsky in high school. My mom, uh, my name is Natasha, although I'm Indian. And, you know, it came from my mom was reading War and Peace when she was in high school. And she liked the name and thought if she had a daughter, she would name her Natasha. And here I am. Um, so, um, anyway, so let me stop here and just tell you that, um, I, and thank, you know, the South Asia Institute for inviting me um, and um, giving me the opportunity to, to read this book um, and to, to talk about it. And why don't I open it up at this point for any comments or questions? Yeah. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> one of the reasons that it's uh, so interesting is because it's simultaneously immigrant and woman yeah. mm. coming coming out, mm. and the two parallel, the two stories resonate with each other because of the uncertainty, which is Natasha, if I may, yes, uh, talks about it is happening at that particular moment in time when things are just beginning to open up for people to do both of these things, and you did them both at the same time. Yeah, being uh, an immigrant and a uh, woman, um, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I feel, <clears throat> you know, I uh, feel very free um, here in America in lots of respects. Um, um, can talk openly, act openly, uh, live by the rules which my father had given me. Uh, uh, I enjoy teaching. Um, my students just love me, uh, and um, uh, it, it's a it's a great life. But. Um, uh, when I was at Harvard and beyond that, uh, going back to India from uh, 59 to 68, 68, and I we came back to America forever for good. Uh, it was very difficult, um, very lonely, full of anguish. Uh, the marriage couldn't be dissolved. Um, and so um, uh, when I talk with a psychiatrist friend, he says, uh, I said, I'm working on my 13th book. Um, so he said, oh, you're just sublimating your, <laughs> your anguish and your loneliness. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sublimation is good. <laughs> <laughs> Put it to good God. I said, OK. Uh, <laughs> that's what it is. But uh, um, I mean, I have always been ambitious from uh, way back, even as a child. And a women's group has asked me, uh, New York City, to talk to um, 
potential donors, uh, mainly Indian. Uh, the group is um, collecting money, sending it to India in the villages to ed educate little girls. And that's it. Education, education, uh, education. Um, little girls, whatever, uh, they have to learn to read, uh, to write, uh, so that the world opens up a little bit, a little bit. Um, and um, uh, if they are ambitious, uh, uh, nourishment comes from the opening up. And, uh, and I think that is uh, very important. And I, I do feel, I don't know if my Indian friends would agree, but that in rural India, this is happening very slowly. Uh, um, little girls, um, you know, leading their own, um, following their own um, sort of ambition, <laughs> going up forward in education. I think this is happening very, very slowly in my view. And so I'm going to talk to this group on uh, May the 10th, and collect some money. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, but I was, uh, I was ambitious from day one. But I was, uh, as I put down in the book, I, uh, growing up, I, feel, I felt like a fish swimming upstream because my parents, uh, I belong to a subcaste of Anavil Brahmins with very strict rules where bride burning prevailed. Uh, women were thrown out if they did not bring enough dowry. That was my subcaste. So I was being prepared to be the best, most well-performing daughter-in-law in somebody else's home. Uh, and so I was fighting for, you know, uh, I want to do something else. Uh, and I will not forget um, an incident when I was, uh, we were that big, and my widowed aunt, uh, to whom I have dedicated the book to his memory, she was standing at the door, and my mother and father had, were, had gone to the village, uh, to the city, uh, and my mother had to be dragged in almost held, and she was crying, and she was saying, how could this happen? And so we children didn't know what was going on. So a few days later, we found out that my parents had gone to visit the cousins of my father, first cousins, and the young man in his late 20s had passed away, and his widow, who was probably in her early 20s, just locked herself in the lavatory, poured kerosene over her, and put her body on fire. That was the custom in the subcast. She did not want to be by herself as a widow. She didn't know what awaited her. Uh, and so uh, um, uh, the, the whole pressure, therefore, of uh, how, how, how can ambition be nourished uh, in a girl who has to fight against uh, these kinds of uh, constraints? And when I went back uh, in 59 from Harvard, I, I will not forget a scene which I created in the living room, my hometown Surat, my parents, and I was crying. <laughs> convulsions. How could you do this? Why did you not warn me about the dangers of sex before I went to Bombay? Uh, uh, why, why did you allow Kaki's hair to be shaved? Kaki was my brother's, my father's brother's teenage widow, and her head was shaved by the barber. And I would watch that as a child. Why did you allow Kaki's head to be shaved? And why did you let this woman carry our excrements on a bucket on her head. Why, why? You had a degree from Cambridge University, and why did all this continue to happen in the, in the house? Uh, and my mother said, you know, she wouldn't talk like this if she had not gone to America. <laughs> so um, it's... Um, 
I quote Chekhov, who uh, in the last chapter where he talks about, he asks Suvorin, Alexei Suvorin, the young writer who is wanting to write Chekhov's life, Anton Chekhov's life. And Chekhov tells Suvorin that when you write about me, my life, bring out how this son of a shopkeeper, a, a serf's boy, um, became a writer and wrung out from himself Rapskaya Krov in Russian, the blood of a slave. Write about that. How you wring out from yourself the, the blood of a slave uh, and become a human being. And so my American journey I like to think of as, you know, becoming a person, a human being. When I ask this uh, chief, one of the judges of South African Supreme Court, name one quality about America. And he said, without flinching, he said, personhood, personhood. When everybody here is a person. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that there is no hierarchy. <laughs> uh, I'm never going to claim that this is a perfect country. Uh, but personhood, you... Uh, as I said, when I enter my building at Columbia, Johnny, the doorman, I always greet Johnny. Hello, Johnny. How are you today? Uh, and he talks with me because he's a person. I just don't walk past him and, you know, because I'm a professor and I don't have to ch talk with a doorman. Um, uh, I mean, that kind of, uh, or like the gardener whom I saw in my American friend's home and the gardener, I started talking with him when I visited my friend and the gardener spoke Hindi. He started talking with me in Hindi and told me a whole story about his three generations of, uh, you know, and then how his life is so good in America, he was never going to go back to India again. And then he said, Sahib, meaning his American employer, whom he referred to as Sahib, when Sahib discusses his guard, gardening chores with me, Sahib always thanks me. But this poor man, do you think he was probably nobody thanked him? Uh, uh, a superior guy didn't thank him? What? I mean, Sahib always thanks me. It make him feel like a person. Um, uh, now, I didn't want to overdo this story because even machines say thank you in America. <laughs> so, but, but there is this, you know, um, um, there are certain norms, courtesies, uh, which are equalizing in my view. So Padma, are you an American or are you an Indian? I'm an American, 100%. But you're married to an Indian. <laughs> that, <laughs> that you can ask him. So, I mean, this is interesting. <laughs> so it's interesting because you know scholars of migration talk about the gender differences in terms of exactly. what happens You're when you migrate. So you know women. There's there's a great article called "Bargaining with Patriarchy," which basically says that women migrate and they can you know now they're sort of. Um, I mean, this is different from your in your case, but a lot of times then enter the workforce in when, after migration and then through that have a little bit of economic power, um, a little more leverage because you're in a society that is not equal but is a little more egalitarian than perhaps the one you came from. Whereas men often lose power through the migration process in terms of, again, a patriarchal kind of coming from a more patriarchal society. Oh, yeah. Um, and again, I don't want to, you know, suggest no, that right. the U.S. is, is an equal right. society, but that, but there are, there are differences often in terms of the, the, the gender. So hence, you're an Indian American and you're an American. <laughs> so you, you had a comment. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? He followed his wife, right? <laughs> I can't imagine Jockish losing power. <laughs> you had a comment over here. You can't lose what you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I have had the privilege and pleasure of reading the book. And Padma, though you talk about becoming an, more of a person, coming into your own power and individuality in the U.S., I would like you to talk about 
how this, those seeds were planted so much before. Yeah. Mm. Because the very fact that you entered into this, you know, what you describe as a disastrous marriage, to me, it was part of a journey mm. of breaking away from your family and the strictures that you grew up. So how did that happen? How come, even though you grew up in a traditional family, was it khaki? <coughs> Who helped you become, or what, what do you think enabled you well, I think that that's a very, <clears throat> very good question. It sets me thinking. But I think I was very ambitious from, from a very young age. I think I got that from my mother. She expressed her ambition in various ways. She brought pets. She brought a dozen hens in the garden. And she exercised her uh, this assertiveness in her own way. Uh, she could barely write, read and write in Gujarati, my mother tongue, my, whereas my father taught Shakespeare. But anyway, she was strong-willed. Um, she was uh, ambitious, and I probably think I got it from her. I always wanted to make something of myself. That was, so competitive, yes. Uh, in the school, from day one, I had to be top of the class. Uh, college, yes, top of the university list. Yeah. I mean, that was my, my goal, and I overworked. I mean, I had a nervous breakdown at the age of 19 when I overworked for my BA examination. Um, I really had a breakdown. Uh, so, um, and even today, uh, I have to start working on my 14th book or, um, as soon as I feel, uh, as soon as I end teaching, uh, which will end in two weeks' time, uh, and start so you, uh, working on the book. So I think this right. is something inside, probably, and but the, the disaster of the first marriage, I mean, it was, uh, it was just, it was, it was a case of pure seduction, I would say. I was a total nincompoop. I had, you know, I was just reading books. Um, I mean, I put down in the book that at the age of 19, I didn't know what the sex act was about. Yeah, I've, I've read her book as well, and I, and I that's agree with true. you. You didn't I mean, know anything. You were like a child when it yes, came to relationships. Yes, and so you were just, uh, you're just taken for a, for a ride. For, for, uh, and a certain degree of generosity and trustfulness uh, is there, which I still notice when I deal with my students. <laughs> uh, Jagdish pulls me up. You know, be careful, be careful. Um, but um, but the, this um, wanting to do something um, and uh, be on my own, and uh, so. It still doesn't answer your question, right? Because she's one of what, four children? And she's the one who had this drive most. So she was probably born with it. I don't know, it's, it's an interesting question. There's Why did you break out of the pack? Yeah. Right? You, you also sort of allude to, I mean, there's this sort of, you know, the, uh, another kind of lo through line of this book is the story of kind of parents and children and, you know, both your relationship with your parents. So on the one hand, um, really being your father's daughter in terms of, you know, your desire to be an intellectual um, and your mother's daughter, as you've, you've just described, in terms of being ambitious, and she was ambitious in her own way. But then breaking out of that, right, and doing your own thing and giving them heartbreak, and then, and then you talk about that with your own daughter, right? So on the one, you know, you talk about how, um, on the one hand, she's very much like you, very ambitious, um, very extremely accomplished, and on the other hand, you know, she's very different from the two of you, and that's kind of given you heartbreak. And that, you know, she's made choices that, you know, in terms of her travel and her career and politics, that, you know, sometimes probably feels to you like she's doing the exact opposite of what you would want her to do, right? So, but there's always this struggle with parents and children in terms of how much do we become ourselves. But then at the core, I, it seems, 
I, my reading was at the core, your daughter is very much like, like the two of you, a product of the two of you. Even if the choices, she's <laughs> made these choices in a very different world and so has made different choices. So, you know, you're, I, I think there is sort of the parental influence, but then breaking out of that as well, as we all, you know, do in our own, in our own way, right? So The, the episode which I, sorry. Well, I would just, I was, what that set off in my head mm. was how, it was the way in which Pardon me, the way in which you mentor students and women students. I'd be interested in yeah. mm. how, you, how you go about mentoring people, because I'm sure you do. I'm yeah, yeah. I mean, I tell them, uh, be on your own, uh, assert yourself. Uh, um, if, when they come and discuss with me their career choices, then I'm very explicit. Do what you think is good for you um, and make up your mind without worrying about what X will do and Y will think and um, I tell them uh, and I, but at the same time I mean it's not like uh, I, I still feel that uh, human relations are very important right um, my relationship with my husband or with my daughter or with my friends or my parents, I mean, uh, these are, you don't just say, well, you know, get lost. And, uh, no, uh, my relationship with my father was very convoluted. Well, my father was my godhead. I mean, nothing my father didn't do. Those trees he planted, the music instrument he played, the stars which, the constellations which he, pointed out. Um, he was such a gifted man um, and with a BA degree from Cambridge University and totally without any ambition. He just gave up his life for educating uh, the college students, establishing colleges, never f worried about what he was paid. Uh, so it uh, but at the same time, he was very conservative in his upbringing about the daughters. Uh, you are going to somebody else's house and the dowry and the bride burning, and so you have to learn to cook and to run the house and be a good wife and all those rules uh, at the same time. So it was, I was conflicted, um, but um, my. I would say my strongest bond in my life is, has been with my father, which is the kind of person he was. He was very passionate, emotional, um, principled. Um, no. So uh, sometimes the reviewer have criticized him for being like this. I know. I mean, he was. Uh, I mean, he was a village boy, after all, who went to England. Um, but he remained a village boy, right? Um, so, and of course, he gave me Shakespeare. Um, so, um, but these conflicted relationships, I think, uh, I do feel, I mean, my mother was, uh, she had bipolar uh, disorder, totally. But I do feel if I had not succeeded in life, uh, I would have probably blamed my parents. <laughs> Who knows? No. But they lived long enough to find fulfillment their own way. My parents lived long enough. Uh, I'm doing well. And so when the, in Sydney, <coughs> when we were in Australia, the Sydney television guy. They said, come give interview. I said, okay. I thought it was my financial crisis book. And the reporter pulled out this book. And I said, where did you get it, this book from? He said, don't ask me where I got this book from. Uh, he, said, uh, uh, he said, why did you decide to write the book now? That was his question. And I said, because uh, personally and professionally, I feel very fulfilled. And I have a story to tell. Um, nobody knew what was going on in my life. Nobody knew except my family, and uh, even my family didn't know some of the details. Uh, so, because I feel fulfilled, <laughs> um, 
probably I have remained generous as a result. And then he was asking me, uh, I told you, I think, why I have dedicated the book to the memory of Kaki, my aunt. So, mm -hmm. may I? Okay. I'm Nietzsche Rosowski. Of course. Hi, Nietzsche. Hi. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I wonder if I may. Um, direct a question in a different direction. Mm. And I think maybe I already know the answer, but I want to ask it anyway. Mm. Um, you, you lived in India at the time, I mean, you were still quite young, but at the time of India becoming uh, an independent country with the British living and mm. all, all of that. And um, I said maybe I'm answering my own question. What I wanted to ask you was, um, you really don't deal with it in the book, just very, very mm -hmm. slightly. And now as I hear you talk, and I read your book, but you know, hearing you makes it even more powerful than it is uh, in the print. I was wondering whether you had so many other issues to deal with that you didn't really go into the political situation at all. You're right. I mean, in the sense that I like to think of the book as a personal memoir. Mm. Uh, it's not about fighting for women's rights or taking, uh, discussing general issues of how customs of child rearing are different here mm -hmm. and there in India. And the editor ro ro uh, raised so many questions with me, the Indian editor. Uh, she was very first rate editor. Discuss this, discuss that. How is child rearing? You brought up your daughter in America. How is it different in America from in? I said, this book is not about child rearing practices. This is a personal memoir. My daughter and how I brought her up and what decision she took and that's it. Similarly, political situation. Okay. Um, the only time it comes about is when my mother, <laughs> she goes shopping uh, and then she discovers that the quality of the uh, cardamom yes. seeds is deteriorating, so she brings up a political comment. She says, oh, the departure yes. of the British from India yes. has resulted in all this yes. decline in quality of goods. I mean, my mother, I mean, what does she know about <laughs> well, She picked it up from my father, or maybe in her comment. But the book is just, uh, I don't, so I don't look upon it as, you nor know, do I want it to be a book f fighting for women's rights. Or um, it is very much a personal memoir for me, uh, and how a woman makes it um, through the trials, personal trials, um, and how America um, ultimately um, and liberated me. So, I mean, it's, so, so that's you. why I yes. don't, uh, yes. but I am working on a book, uh, American Exceptionalism, uh, where I'm going to bring about some of these broader issues mm -hmm. of how America is different uh, on this thing and that thing, uh, and how it is superior despite some of its shortcomings. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. But, but Nietzsche's question could be turned around a bit in terms of, you know, linking up with what uh, Lakshmi was asking about, you know, why were you different, right? Uh, and uh, during, before the independence struggle, <clears throat> Gandhiji had actually put women yeah. in the, you know, front of uh, the political movement, uh, bringing them, you know, invoking mythology to say goddesses are, you know, being in the pantheon and so on. So they were not just licking stamps like in left-wing parties, but they were actually leading. Uh, and so people got used to seeing women ha leaning in, as it were, right? And so I just wondered if you, and, and after that, Nehru also put his sister as the General Assembly uh, Chairman, which election funded, and there were lots of women who were coming up. Did that play any role in your? No, no, not in, in my, out, not in my, not in my, that not in my thinking, question. not in my, no, uh, no, because I think you, uh, what impact does all have, all this have, Nehru and Gandhi and uh, on little girls' position in, at home, 
when they are being brought up? Uh, are the parents liberated enough to tell the girl, you are no different from the boy? Which mother will tell her daughter even today? Maybe some fancy homes in Bombay and in the big cities? Yeah. I don't know. That you are, you are, uh, you are the same as the boy. Uh, um, that you are not going to go into somebody else's home and look after um, uh, that person's uh, welfare and family and all that. I think, I think in in whatever the economic advancement, political liberation, in so many social practices, the country is so behind. I mean. Think of Haryana, uh, um, where female infant infanticide, Haryana is India's most prosperous state, rural, vigorous farming. Female in infanticide is highest in Haryana. Children, are, fem female children are just gotten rid of because now you have the test finding the fetus of the sex of the fetus. So I, I'm not very, hope, I'm not going to sing songs about how India has advanced in terms of social uh, family norms inside the family. I believe it still remains very much a hierarchical patriarchal system. Neelam, you speak out some. <laughs> uh, what do you think? I mean, I don't know what Lakshmi... I would like to say, I think uh, you dedicated your book to Kaki, and my feeling is that probably you didn't want to be, didn't want to have a life of Kaki, and that probably caused the reaction in you to mm. be different and uh, to really achieve. Mm. And, uh, you know, so that seems like... Uh, you know, because yeah. she did influence you. She was she was a very power. She had a powerful influence on you. Oh yeah, her Even condition in the book, you had have uh, written about yeah. Kaki and. Uh, yeah, I mean she was. Um, she was just um, Kaki was my father's brother's teenage widow, which father brought from the village when he settled down and had his own home. Kaki never left home. She never wore sandals. She wore the same colored sari. She covered her head. Her he head was shaven all. I watched the barber shaving her head. And she pampered us and she nurtured us. Uh, but um, uh, think of it today. Uh, when I cite a number of um, um, how many million widows does India have? There is a statistic. You get that number. Uh, how many million widows? I mean, what the hell? Widows can't remarry? That's what it means. Widows find it very difficult to remarry in India. You may be holding a degree from an a uh, leading university or somewhere. A widow cannot remarry. Changing now. No. It's changing in, the, in big, country, big cities. It is changing. It is I changing. Have, they always say of... India is changing. India is changing. But you have to give me the numbers, proportion. Uh, it's a country where 60 percent of the people still live in the villages. Haryana is backward in a lot of ways. But now there is not a single widow in Haryana. Like there is not a single? Next day. Hmm? In there is Haryana. not a single widow in Haryana. I hope so. No, no, never. They, they have they get married right away. In yeah. Haryana, there is a tradition that uh, if uh, there is if if a woman get, becomes widow, she gets married to one of the brothers. That's right. Okay, that's uh, good. Because mm. I think it's in a lot of ways it is very important because mm. it, it has because they land they don't have to divide the but land. But yes, and, okay. And but then you can't you can't generalize from that. It's only over rural in India in. In UP, it, Uttar Pradesh, the Gangetic Belt, or in Bihar, the poorest states of India. Uh, so uh, there are widows in my own family, highly educated, 
beautiful women who became widows in their late 30s, they're still unmarried. Why doesn't the family promote their remarriage? This is in urban, my own family. So, I mean, it's no, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't buy it. Um, okay, there are some exceptions, but uh, um, the, uh, I mean, just imagine, um, why don't they publish the number of widowers in India? But there, because there are no widowers. <laughs> <laughs> you have a whole chapter on Anuradha. Mm. Um, so what was her reaction to the book? Yeah, um, what what did, did she support your writing it? How much of it did she know? What were the big surprises for her? How did she react to it when she... She, <laughs> she is keeping quiet about the book. Not <laughs> 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 a good sign. And this, is, this is the frank, forthright answer. Um, she, uh, the only chapter I cleared with her was the chapter about her. I didn't want to upset her anyway. So I said, here is the chapter on you. Let me know if it's OK. And that was it. Um, otherwise, uh, but uh, of course, she's very proud of me. You can see it when uh, she talks with me and all that. Um, so she was a close relationship with her mother. Yeah. I'm the bad cop, she's a good cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's uh, uh, very... Uh, I think the, the one thing which I haven't asked you actually after reading the book is when your father actually, when you got the second rank, which is almost like, you know, the top rank and after what, 100,000 candidates and so on. Uh, in the matriculation, which is a university entrance exam, we call, we call it metric, remember? Right. And so at that time, her father told her that this is going to be a crown of thorns. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned that. And yeah. now that is really ups unsettling, right? Instead of the father rejoicing that you know his, his daughter has done so well, uh, he's saying this because he's thinking of how it will unsettle her, make her more ambitious, and she's not going to be a good good candidate for a daughter-in-law and things like that. So, so how did you react to that? It made no impact on me because I didn't understand what it meant. Oh, really? I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had got a, missed my first rank by one mark or two marks <laughs> among 48,000 candidates. and. The, city was descending people where my teacher math teacher came brought gifts for me of a Schaefer pen and pencil gold plated <laughs> and i was on top of the world and um, you're wearing a crown of thorns um, i hadn't read the bible and i didn't know what he meant it wasn't <laughs> but he was <laughs> but it was i mean like i wanted to learn to type uh, at the age of, as soon as I entered college. And he said, no, um, I want a bicycle uh, for my matriculation. Uh, so, uh, so, did I. so he would. <laughs> How well did you do, John? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I got the first rank, so it's a matter of fluke to some extent. So there was this um, pit cycles, which was like Toyota cycles and so on. Um, it always remained a cycle for because of Indian economics, which is another story. <laughs> but the, uh, so I got a bicycle, and she got as the first woman, you know. Uh, this, and I, I, I still don't know how to ride a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> I was showing my tendency to, to be a, an economist, because when I went to the showroom, uh, there was about a dozen bicycles, and I said, which one do you want? So I said, give me the most expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> and it stayed in our house. Nobody ever did. But she was, of course, into cycling a lot. So she was an early environmentalist. <laughs> I mean, you're wearing a crown, crown of thorns, but he's, they wouldn't, I wanted to learn to type when I was 17, 18. And my father said, no, because the typing class 
was far out in the city. And I had the bicycle. I could go to the typing class, right? No, because, so I said to myself, maybe he was worried I could get knocked down by a bus. Or, he was just too protective, too sheltered, too, as a result, too constrictive. Uh, but I learned uh, secretly to go to the class. In the early 50s, uh, parents will not even allow girls to go to college, even in India. Exactly. Oh, with such conservative uh, ideas, how did your father agree to, for you to leave India and come here? Well, um, this is something I also, to come to America, no, at right. first That's we leave Surat to go to Bombay. Surat. Surat. Yeah. 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 But by that time, I was already yeah. married, oh, right? Yeah. So he, my parents yeah. had no yeah. voice in that decision. Yeah. Uh, but but even to go to college. Yeah, yeah. 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 Bombay yeah. because yeah. I had uh, won so many fellowships mm -hmm. uh, after the BA examination. And my father had, I think he had a moral issue there that how can I prevent her from going to Bombay when she has earned so much money to finance her own education herself, her master's degree herself. I think that was, uh, and he said, uh, he trusted me, uh, and I messed up my life. A question. Um, so you published this book in India first, and I was curious about that decision. Is it sort of were you sort of looking towards an Indian audience to sort of tell the story, or is it was that more happenstance? Or um, I think I I wanted to lay out the whole the whole truth mm -hmm. from beginning to end. Couple of things I haven't mentioned because some names were involved, but um, so um, India, America. I mean, I had no particular okay. audience in mind. Nor, as I said, it. I I look upon it as a personal yeah. story. I I don't want to make an impact on. If people find inspiration, yes, but but that was not the purpose. The next book is you know, about uh, what is wrong, what is right, uh, you know, how should things change uh, in India, uh, why is America better? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in a way, next book. keeping it personal makes it even, it can, can make it more impactful, right? Because yeah, it, it, a, I think all of the themes that people have brought up and are sort of alluding and you're saying, no, it's not that, it, it re those come very powerfully. It's almost like an anthropologist, you know, anthropologists sort of say, we kind of under, learn the general by looking specific and that's sort of, you know, telling this very individual specific story and through your own voice, um, these, I think, really highlight some of these broader issues that sort of, you know, yeah. your life is in the context of. And so it, it, it really, you know, I think it has that impact as well. Mm -hmm even if it's not intentional. Maybe more so because it's not intentional and it's sort of, you know, you allow the reader to sort of make mm. those connections. Any last, we have time for maybe one more comment or question. <coughs> well, why don't we? Well, so MIT Press is bringing out the book in uh, September. Yeah. Mm, I'm very happy. So, raving about it, <laughs> <laughs> if I may say openly. MIT Press, um, so uh, I feel very good about it. So it'll come out in September, um, the American, because this cannot be sold outside India. So um, it still has a limited market. It won't be reviewed so, either. It's a, publishing is a highly restricted enterprise. I mean, unless a book is published here, it won't be reviewed by the US newspapers and magazines. Yeah. I didn't Naturally. know that at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, uh, be an economist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why should they review it if nobody can buy it? But I had uh, so uh, much... Uh, <laughs> 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 also, also, people to 
A lot of people do manage to get it. <laughs> so, well, we'll, look, we'll, we'll be seeing the reviews okay. soon yeah. enough. <laughs> but I'm I, sure had, I had be. so much difficulty getting this book published in America. Uh, I went through so many huh. agents. No, I directly well, contacted some you publishers. Unless, no. The big presses, commercial presses won't take you unless you go through an agent. So if an agent does, is not interested because there's, because you're not talking about your father having raped you and things like that, you can't really get a memoir published. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> then, so, uh, then somebody so said, send it. it. So there's all kinds of restrictions in the game. Send it to India, to so Penguin. Many publishers wanted it like Knopf and so on, oh. but this you've got to go through an agent. Hmm. And there was no agent that she could find. Well, I'm glad that it's coming out through MIT yeah. Press. It's a great and, press, um, and I'm looking forward to the reaction here. Never and forget the comment it. from my Indian editor as soon as she looked at the manuscript. And she wrote back to me saying, where did you learn to write like this? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, I still remember that. Nandini Mehta, my editor. So, uh, on that note, I want to thank you for oh, thank coming you, to Harvard Bob. and sharing your, your experience. And, and so, I think there's a reception just outside. Just outside. So, I hope everyone will join us for, for a drink and some nibbles. Wonderful. That was great.